Hi everyone, Pastor Ryan here again. Thank you for joining us for another week of online worship. Uh, it's been such a joy to see the ways that everyone has been engaging and interacting with worship this past week and sharing their faith in some really unique, creative ways. Uh, thank you again for joining us. I'm excited Pastor Stephen is going to be here with us to worship once again as we continue on looking at the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. Uh, this week we're going to be getting to look at the church at Sardis and the ways that we have been called to be a people with an active living faith. We join me in a word of prayer now as we be, uh, begin this time together. God, open our hearts and our minds to your word this day as we once again continue to look at what it means to be your faithful living people here in this world, God. Help us to recognize the role that we have and play in being your ambassadors of the kingdom so that others might know you and love you more. It's in your name we pray now. Amen. All right, so I chose Create in Me a Clean Heart kind of ties into what we were talking about in Revelations where um, God wants us to, to realize that he's not done with us yet and that uh, he calls us to repent of our ways. And um, so it's this is uh, from the Psalms, Psalm 51, I believe, where David's uh, um, talking about his uh, affair with Bathsheba. Um, God's about to, or Nathan prophesies that God's going to take um, David's son that was born from from this adulterous relationship um, but David's repenting of, of that relationship repenting of sinning against God um, and it just kind of applies to what we've been talking about in Revelation so it goes like this God continue to draw us closer to him. May, may we realize that we are offered an opportunity to clean our hearts through repentance. In God's peace. Amen. Amen. Hey, what you doing? You almost done? Uh, I'm working on schoolwork. I'll be done here soon. Give me a second. Why do you have a bottle of tears? <laughs> Funny you should ask. Hi kids, uh, from Psalm 56, 8, David asked God to put his tears in a bottle. You see this bottle here? It's my tears bottle, I call it. They're not real tears, it's just water, but it reminds me of times that I have cried real tears. Now, I don't know that God keeps our tears in a bottle like this one, um, but I do believe that God sees our tears and hears us when we cry. Do you ever cry? In and of course we do. What are some things that might make you cry? Have you ever fallen down and hurt yourself so badly that you cried? Have you ever been sad enough that you've cried? Yeah. Have you ever had someone hurt your feelings and make you cry? Hopefully your brothers and sisters aren't the ones making you cry this week. But have you ever cried because someone else was crying? Yeah, that happens too. We all cry, don't we? 
And did you know that Jesus cried? The shortest verse in the Bible says Jesus wept. And there's at least three examples of when Jesus cried. The Bible tells us that Jesus cried when he prayed for others. It says, while Jesus was on earth, he offered prayers and pleading with a loud cry and tears. Hebrews 5, 7. The Bible tells us that Jesus cried when he saw people who were missing out on what God wanted for them. It's kind of what our sermon lesson's about today that Pastor Ryan and I talk about. Luke tells us that Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city and he, and he wept over it. And he said, I wish that even today you would find the way to peace. But now it's too late and peace is hidden from you. In Luke chapter 19, verse 41 and 2. Another time in the Bible, uh, the Bible says that Jesus cried when friends of his were hurting. Jesus had a friend named Lazarus who was very sick and his sisters Mary and Martha, they sent word to Jesus and asked him to come and heal Lazarus. But by the time Jesus arrived, Lazarus had died. The Bible tells us that when Jesus saw Mary weeping because her brother had died, that he cried too. This isn't all that Jesus did though. Listen to what happens next. Jesus went with Mary and Martha and some others to the grave site where Lazarus was buried. And it was a cave with a large stone at the entrance. And when they got to the tomb, Jesus said to some of the men, Take away the stone. In a loud voice, Jesus said, Lazarus, come out! And Lazarus walked out of the grave. I imagine that when Mary and Martha saw that uh, those tears became tears of joy and they were no longer tears of sadness. We all cry. And I'm glad that we have a Savior who weeps with us. I'm glad that He loves us so much that He hurts when we are hurting. He feels our pain, He sees our tears, and He keeps our tears in a bottle. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, it's comforting to know that when we cry, that you cry with us. But it's even more comforting to know that you have power over death and the grave, and that one day we will be in heaven with you. And then there will be no more tears. Lord, we ask that you watch over us as we continue our, our time with our families and our homes. May you uh, allow peace uh, to be with us. Lord, watch over these young children. Um, as they are home, give them opportunities to continue to learn, and may they know your love. Thank you, Lord. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everyone. We're back here again for, with another opportunity to worship together. Stephen's here with me again, and uh, we're going to continue looking at the uh, seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, and this week, we're jumping in with uh, chapter three now. We're, we're jumping into Sardis. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about what that message that church received was and, and how it can apply to our lives today. Um, so Stephen, Stephen and I, we, we kind of got together. Stephen, we talked a little bit about this already, uh, and, and there's there's a really great reminder from all of these letters, I think, um, that this wasn't just about these seven churches. I mean, this was about all of God's people throughout all time to be reminded of some things, correct? Yeah, I, I like what you said um, while we were talking about uh, these churches were like the central hubs of the areas, and uh, these letters were given to those churches then for the churches to go out and disperse uh, the Lord's message uh, to the region. Yeah, absolutely. John John wasn't stupid when it came to recognizing there were several churches very close by that he had been working with already that he knew of that could receive these words, but also then be able to share them abroad. This was a book read in worship. This wasn't just a book or a letter for them to read and keep to themselves. This this was a public message that John was sharing from Christ himself to the church. Right, and, and we also discussed the fact that they didn't just read this letter to Serta at, at Serta, at Sardis, they they read all the letters to each of the churches. Yeah, yeah. So so they weren't just hearing this message for Sardis and that was it. This was this was, hey, Sardis, here's your things, but but be aware there's other traps and pitfalls and and, and also good things that you should be looking to uh, to do as a church in this day and age. And and it's still a message for us to receive. We we still face a lot of those same problems and temptations and and things that kind of draw us away from our relationship with God, which 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 kind of ties into what Sardis heard today. Yeah. I, I uh, there's some good things in here, and it's interesting that we actually gonna break we're actually gonna break it down verse by verse the first few because there's so much in these 
few short chat um, this few short verses that are here we're only going to read six verses but there's a lot of a lot of uh, things here to, to take into consideration when we look at this scripture today. Yeah, absolutely. With that being said, I think it's a great segue. Let's uh, let's jump into that first verse there. And uh, so, verse uh, one in chapter three of Revelation uh, begins this letter to the church at Sardis. This is what it says: To the angel at the church in Sardis, write: These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So, so there's, there's a lot in there already. Yeah. I mean, we kind of have to break this verse down even into sort of a sub verse, uh, verse A, verse 1A and verse 1B here, because verse 1A um, begins with this image of, of the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about this. I mean, how do, we, how do we understand this today? Well, and if you go back to verse 20 in chapter 1, it says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Mm -hmm. and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So there's a little bit of clarity what, when there's talking about the seven stars. Um, and and Revelation is one of those things that there, uh, there's a lot of things that can send you on a rabbit trail if you allow it. Um, so there is a little clarification there. It doesn't really clarify about the seven spirits, which we talked a little bit about. Um, it talks the spirits of... of of things that were mentioned in Isaiah, um, but we, we don't need to get into that, but we, we can't always get stuck on some of the things that we don't understand, um, but the seven stars is explained there. Um, but it's saying, like, if we look at, um, it's, it's the Spirit of God that ho holds all this together, and it's the, it's the, um, it's those things that, um, that are like important for us as a church and that's what Christ is trying to reemphasize here that you know there's some things here that we need to do and we need to keep doing and doing and, and be conscious about how we're doing it yeah absolutely and and not to not to dig into that like that rabbit hole you said we want to yeah. be careful not to go down but the uh, reference to Isaiah actually comes from Isaiah 11 um, and it's it's kind of a you, you, I, I think you have to kind of do a little leaping and bounding to kind of make it fit but I think it's a really great reference to the idea that Jesus Christ has the in fullness of the Holy Spirit within him right. uh, and, and the, the goal is that we too would, would live into the relationship that he has with the Holy Spirit and with God the Father that he demonstrates throughout the Gospels and and this beauty of, of revelation is uh, we, we have to think of this not as a uh, necessarily of a book of all these intentional um, literal images all the time, but, but more about a book of art, uh, of, of worship of, of, uh, of imagery and, and numbers playing a deeper role and deeper meaning than, than what is just in the literal words. Uh, so like the number seven, you know, and I, our congregation knows this here at First Church, that, that the number seven is really a combination of two important numbers, four and three, which represent earthly and, and spiritual completion or perfection. Uh, and so this number seven is saying this is the complete Holy Spirit. We're not just getting a taste of things here. Jesus Christ has the full Holy Spirit to give and share with us as he does in Acts. He says, you know, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit upon you. You will have this, this spirit to, to fill you and guide you and lead you in a living a holy life. Yeah. Yeah, there's, um, um, there's lots of, of imagery here, and it's one of those things that, I don't know if we talked about it last week or you and I talked about it, but, you know, when John was seeing these things of God, like, he had to put them in human terms. Yeah, and when you're exactly. seeing things that are of God, it, it, it talks about, like, the, it was like a sea of glass. It was like streets of gold. Because mm -hmm. that's all that he could think about to, to describe the things that he saw when he was um, having these dreams. Yeah, it's, it's tough to sometimes put God into words because they always fall short. Right. And, and even the images that God has Im Im impressed upon John to share with these churches, I mean, he, he's trying to make sense of them and help them understand, you know, you've got to hear this message. It's, we, we could debate all day what the seven spirits are, but we have to understand this is Christ. This is something positive that Christ has right. and, and wants us to, to recognize. So that's that's really critical there. So then we kind of get to that second half. This is where where, where John's really starting to say here's here's where here's where the problem lies. Here, here's where we need to have some some honest critique and, and accountability to what you're doing as a church. Where he says, you know, you have this really great reputation for being alive, and, and reputations can be what we want them to be at some level. Right. But Christ knows and is calling you out on the fact that you really are dead. 
I mean, that's some strong language there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And, and it reminds me of oftentimes we hear people say, well, I served my time, and yet we're called to, to be servants of Christ and to continue to seek the, the journey and continue on that journey uh, until the Lord calls us home. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and as we were kind of talking about this, we, we shared a little bit of a different point of view on, on what that means, and, and yet we see a, a relationship to that. Yeah. You know, you, you look at it from the perspective of um, the priesthood of all believers doesn't stop at a certain age. Right. It may change in the role or, or the way we interact with it at some level maybe, right, but, right. but it never stops. It never changes in that regard. Right. You know, as I was looking at that, my thought was, man, I can make my reputation look like I want it to. I mean, social media has created a world of opportunity for me to make people think I'm, I'm doing all sorts of the right stuff, and yet I can still be dead on the inside. Right. And the Pharisees were kind of called out on that. They were called whitewashed tombs. I mean, yeah. on the outside, they looked like they had it all together, right? Yeah. And yet all their behavior didn't mask to Christ the fact that, that their hearts were, were dead when it came well, to God's love. Because they had that understanding of of these laws that they were enforcing, they forgot the the um, the intention behind those laws. And that's what Jesus came to address uh, in their lives, which applies to us today. Too often we're that we wash the cup on the outside, uh -huh. you know, and yet the inside of the cup is what's dirty, in reference to other scripture. Sure. And, um, you know, and, and God has called each of us uh, into relationship with him. And, and through that, we're called to go make disciples of the nations. And that doesn't stop when I turn 65 and it, the world tells me it's time for me to retire and go sit on a beach. Right. Um, it, it, my calling is to, to make disciples of the nation, no matter if I'm serving as a pastor or if I'm working at the Walmart as a greeter. Right. Exactly. Yeah, so that's a great, great reminder that... that uh, it's kind of a both end, and this is this is where that work of art imagery kind of talk about of revelation kind of comes into play here because we're looking at the exact same words, and, and the lens through which we are are viewing and, and interpreting this this scripture is kind of based on some of our own experience yes. here, and it's not to say that either of us are wrong. I mean, there's a message that this living word of God might be communicating to each of us differently that are both valid. Right. Uh, and we have to be careful. We can't just interpret anything we want in Scripture. But, right. but at the same time, I think the beauty of, of God's Word is that it can do that. That it, it, through our own lens that um, we are experiencing, God can speak into that, that situation Absolutely. with a lot of great truth for us. So that's awesome. So, uh, so why, don't we, why don't we take a look at verse 2 now? Would you mind reading that? Let's kind of unpack what he has to say here because of what he just offered. Well, he just said, but you are dead. And now he's saying, wake up. Strengthen and rem um, strengthen what remains. Uh, yeah, strengthen what remains and uh, is about to die. So not everything's dead. He's just saying, you're, yeah. if, if you let it go, it's going to die. Yeah, but you're on just, life support right now. Right. So but wake uh, up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. So that goes back to what I was saying about, you know, our job as believers is never done. Um, God always has a role for us, and, and, and too often if we look in, inside the doors of the churches, we have the older generation sitting in this corner and the younger generation sitting in this corner, and a lot of times the gap between is there's a gap. Yeah. Um, kids graduate from youth group and high school, and the church doesn't have a lot to offer till they have kids of their own, then they bring their kids back and start them in the nursery. But how do we how do we realize that there's still a role for for all people, uh, whether they're in that in between age or whether they're elderly or or young? We all have a role. How do we find a way to like work side by side to do what God calls us to do as our individual churches and as as the church? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love the the uh, the call to wake up. Um, there's there's this kind of sense of of. Um, we're just kind of being lazy in our faith, yeah. that we've kind of fallen asleep at the wheel, if you will. Um, and, and, and I love that it harkens to a scripture that, that we talked a little bit about there in uh, Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, um, which again was a, a, a church that John also wrote to. Um, so, so it's a really neat kind of dual connection there to, to the word of God. But if we look at Ephesians 5.14, um, we get to hear what he has to say there. And he says... Um, um, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And that, and that verse uh, in context is in, in this, this uh, whole train of, of Paul trying to help 
the church at Ephesus understand how to live a holy life, how to live in such a way that God has called us to in our own unique circumstances to honor the life that he's called us to live. Um, and so, so it's a really great call to, to recognize, hey, I'm not the only one saying this, guys. Wake up. Like yeah. you've heard this before, it's not just it's not just this this nice little phrase that we offer. You, you know, it's interesting in the midst of this uh, COVID nineteen outbreak. Um, you know, the the Pope, I think it was this week, he called the the he called the people to to pray at twelve o'clock on Wednesday. Right. And if you think about it, I um, there's twenty four time zones, and if everyone was praying at noon in their time zone. The whole world would be praying for 24 hours. That would be crazy. Yeah. So I, um, I'm, 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 I'm anxious to, uh, to see the outcome of the people coming together in prayer um, as we come together as a whole world, not just as a nation, not just as a church, but as the whole world. Uh, we come together this past Wednesday um, to, to pray. And like I said, 24 hours of prayer by the whole world. Uh, that's gonna that that could be life changing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think God would honor that. I, I would hope that, that 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 even in the midst of that, we would hear God speak to us, and and maybe not in the way we think, but but I think God's gonna speak to us through that. I, I think there's something important to recognize in there, um, for sure. Yeah. So so and as I was thinking about that too, I also I called to mind a couple other places where Jesus was speaking to the disciples um, during what would have been the Holy Week, the Passion Week, leading up to his crucifixion. Uh, and in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, starting at chapter twenty four, he actually offers a reminder that that if we're not awake, you know that's when bad things happen. You know if we're not paying attention, um, you know there could be potentially hazardous consequences that, that he doesn't want us to experience, but he has to be honest about it. It's this disclaimer, we need to read the terms and conditions of what we signed up for. Right. Um, so in, in chapter 24 of Matthew, um, verse 40, uh, 42 and 43, he, he says, um, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. I mean, he's literally saying, don't fall asleep. Don't, don't go, don't go, you know, getting distracted here on me. Uh, but then he goes on, he says, understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. And he closes verse 44 then by saying, so you must also be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you don't expect him. You know, it's, it's, again, it all kind of goes back to this idea of we can't fall asleep. We can't get lazy in, in trying to live this, this life that God has called us to, or, or we risk, you know, something significant here. Right. I mean, we're risking missing out on, on meeting with, with the bridegroom when he returns. And, and, and Christ uses that then as the imagery in, in chapter 25 and in the, in the first uh, 13 verses there of this parable where there's these, these brides in waiting um, and the culture, you know, at that time they would wait and, and watch for all the time when the bridegroom would finally come and say, hey, my, my house, the house that I built for us is ready. We can finally get married, you know, and th that could come at any hour, you know, and they had to be ready. And, and if they weren't ready, they risked not being able to, to, to marry at that point. And Christ uses that to say, you've got to be ready. The, the bride of Christ, his church, needs to always be watching out for when he will come and be ready for that time. Not, not, not to, to scare us, because fear is not what Christ is using to uh, draw us in together, but, but um, you know, we have to be looking for that relationship to always be a part of who we are. Well, and, and he talks about, um, later in Matthew, um, about the sheep and the goats, is that? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, and it's, I think, in the same chapter there, the end of 25. Right, like, we, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Right, absolutely. So being ready means always seeing the opportunities that are before us to be that light of Christ in, in the midst of uh, a virus, in the midst of um, normal life, in, in the midst of uh, when things are going well for us, or even when they're going bad for us uh, individually. We have to be willing uh, and always able to, to reflect that light and that love of Christ so that we can share the hope that we have with other people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's important to recognize here, John's words to Sardis, if we go back to Revelation 3, is really kind of a, almost like a doctor's warning, if you will. Um, you know, I dated a girl uh, a while back whose stepfather actually had a, a pretty bad heart attack. 
and, and we got to talking and, and, and I, I kind of recognized that, hey, I mean, this is kind of like John saying, you're, you're, you're nearing a significant heart attack here. Strengthen what remains because if your heart's not strong enough, you're not gonna you're not gonna survive. That's that's kind of the imagery that we can kind of connect it to here. Yeah, but we live in a society where um, we get those warnings, but yet we don't follow through. Um, yeah. We we just say, well, we can have open heart surgery, or or you know, I'm overweight, so I can have my uh, these other surgeries instead of saying there's some warning signs and here's some things you need to do. We don't put in the effort. Right. And it's that way sometimes with our faith that we are to be in relationship with Jesus. And that takes some effort. It does. It takes um, some discipline to sit and spend time quietly in a world that spins so fast. It takes time to, to sit and read the scriptures. And, and a lot of times there's questions. I don't understand what this means. Um, and we get stuck there. Uh, but we, we need to put in the effort um, and not look for the quick fix. Exactly. I um I liked one of the things we talked about earlier in the week too that uh, <clears throat> saying you know it says wake up um, that our job's not done we we retire vocationally you said but not spiritually yeah absolutely I, I think it's important that um, you know we from a from a purely secular standpoint we all have our jobs that we we do or or thing roles that we fill vocationally in in some regard um and at some point or another that changes at some point or another we ultimately kind of retire from that right. at some level but but spiritually there is no such thing as retirement right. um even after we pass on and move into the to the glory of god's presence in full uh beyond this life i mean there's still a sort of a sense of there there will always be that that relational connection to god that we maintain that that will never stop and, that, and that, you know, that may look different. I don't know what functionally that will look like in heaven or in the kingdom that's to come. But at the same time, we spiritually are always pouring into that relationship with God. We can't right. give up on that. Right. Absolutely. That's that's great yeah. to, to remind us of. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so, so as we wrap all that together, I mean, let's, let's kind of synthesize all that together then um, as we take those first three verses there. Um, sort of what we're, we're really important, what we're, what we're really meant to remember here, what's really kind of critical for us is to always be on the lookout for ways that our faith is, is kept alive. That it's not just on life support, but that it's flourishing. We right. want our, our spiritual journey, our relationship with Christ to always be filled with the Holy Spirit, to always be looking at how are we edifying the church? How are we building up what is here for us to offer to the world for the sake of Christ's glory? And, and, and that's interesting, uh, an interesting concept because we have so many different generations and each generation does something different. Um, but yet if we don't interact, mm. then the beliefs of, of the older generation are not passed down to the beliefs of the next generation. And, and they have a convoluted understanding of who Jesus is and what yeah. the church is. Um, and yet we take no time to, to kind of sit, let's discuss this. And, and when and I found in my personal experience that when we sit and have a discussion, um, people are more willing uh, to to look at oh well maybe I was wrong maybe there's more to what the Bible says than just the verses that I like to pick out um, and and when we can have a discussion well this is why um, I believe um, the scriptures and, and they can say well what about this and then we can have a discussion but too often. We, we, we let that, that line in the sand, and um, you're, you're progressive, and I'm uh, uh, traditional, or, or you're Republican, I'm Democrat. We or you like the Ravens, I like the Steelers. I mean, there's all sorts of camps we can split well, here. Well, don't but... put me in that category. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But yeah, they, um, there, there are so many different dividers that we allow um, to build walls between us, and that doesn't that doesn't help anybody doesn't help the church it's about sitting with people that are different than us and saying let's have this conversation and and that by by doing that i'm able to work out some of my fears and doubts uh about the scriptures i'm i'm able to to understand oh you struggle with that same thing good i don't feel so bad uh, and maybe i won't be stuck on that we can right. i can move on yeah, and that's, I mean, it all comes back to discipling is really an intergenerational process. Yeah. I mean, there is so much wisdom that some of those who have gone on 
um, in age before us have that can be imparted and really help younger generations kind of unpack and understand. And at the same time, those, those youthful people can remind folks that it's important to always be open and, and learning and growing and recognizing right. there's more that we don't know yet. Right. There, there's more than we can ever fully know and understand of God and, and his creation. And, and yet there's that that give and take, that that back and forth song and dance between the generations that is a beautiful thing when it occurs well. And so it's, it's a good reminder for us then to, to recognize that. I, I always say that uh, the more I learn about God, the more there is to know. You mm. put it that... The more you learn, the the less you think you know, or, or however. Uh, yeah, the more. So the more I learn, uh, the more I realize I don't know. Right. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We, we've never we've ne- we never get to a point where we obtain all of who God is. Right. Um, and it's intended that way, um, because God's bigger than all of us. Sure. God's bigger than anything that we can wrap our minds around. Um, but it's that pursuit. Absolutely. And and how do we pursue it in a manner that I'm able to bring people with me, not push someone away because they believe differently than me. Yeah, and beyond that, I think tying that back into to what John has to say here, it's it's not only the pursuit of God, the pursuit of the knowledge of God, but but as we gain that knowledge, what does that do to my life? How does that change who I am at my very core? That changes how I live and operate in this world that is kind of the antithesis of what God is, is drawing us toward. Well, and, and if we look back there at verse 3, it says um, that... Uh, Therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it mm-hmm. and repent. A lot of times we, we leave out that repent part, and we like to say, well, God yeah. loves you and he accepts you as you are. That's true, but we're called to repentance, which just means to turn away. Right. Um, even though the world tells us that these things aren't wrong, um, the scriptures are, are clear in what, ple- what is pleasing to God. Yeah, I mean, Christ meets this woman at the well. And, and, you know, is calling out these these issues in her life, not to condemn her, but to say you can do, you you are called to more than this. Right. You know, my love can transform your life if you let it. He you know says I love you, but, but go, go and sin no more. Yeah, right. absolutely. There's this tagline that that we can't separate the two pieces there. Right. And that's God's love, I think, in mercy, giving us that opportunity to to have a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance if we're willing to turn and let our lives be transformed again. Yeah, and and uh, too often we forget that part about we need to repent, which is turn away, and and through that repentance, it draws us closer to Christ. Yeah, absolutely. So. And, and and we started here at our church with, with the, the season of Lent by, by reminding ourselves that's what this season calls us to do, right. to recognize the need to repent. And that's why we're, we're working through these seven letters is, is each one of them at some level is kind of a call to repent, mm. to, to recognize where we've come up short. And, that, and that's really critical to be reminded of that, right. that, that our lives lived in Christ's salvation are, are critically um, tied to whether or not we're willing to repent. Yeah, absolutely. So let's kind of let's maybe let's wrap up this, this letter here. Let's, let's kind of take a look at what John has to offer in the last three verses here. Uh, so verses four, th- four through six say this, Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I mean, there, there's some, some great stuff there because that, that line where he says, I will, but I will acknowledge his name before my father is such a reminder that, you know, if we deny Christ with our mouth or even with our actions, it seems like, um, he's going to deny us before the father. And we, that's the last thing we want, right? Yeah, that goes back to that Matthew, uh, that Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. You yeah. Know? Well done, good and faithful servants, or um, be gone before I never knew you. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's important. We want to make sure that we're acknowledged before God. That gives us the opportunity to, to live into that kingdom of joy and peace and prosperity that God is bringing in that new world that we will see one day. And that's important because that ties later into to Revelation 21, where we, we often want to hear the good stuff. We, we don't want all that stuff in the middle, right. but, but that's what we want to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. We often uh, look for the reward without having to put the effort in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and that's that's important because we can't not be a part of the process and expect to reap the harvest. Right. We've got to sow in order to reap. 
you know that that's really important and and so so what the the reward there is 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 not only being acknowledged but being robed in white i mean what do you make of that well that uh imagery of um you know being my my sin i'm i'm dirty and filthy because of the sin that i have mm. but christ allows me to to be um cleansed of that the cleansed by the blood of the lamb it talks about yeah. the songs that we sing um that uh no matter where I've been and no matter what I've what, what has happened in my life that I have an opportunity to be clothed in white when I repent and turn to the Lord and he's waiting and ready to to wrap me in this clean white robe so I could be uh, with him in eternity yeah and, and it's kind of uh, this is how we kind of know that imagery plays an important role here because elsewhere in scripture it talks about through the blood of the lamb will be washed white as snow, but yeah. but blood's not white, is it? No. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, it's red, yeah. and so there's this this weird um, image of, of being made white with a, a red liquid, yeah. um, and that doesn't make sense to our minds. But that's that's the reality here is that it's not about a literal whiteness, but about a purity. Right. That that all that dirt is washed away. Yeah, and that's that's great because um, that's what we again that's what we hope for. We, as Christians, we hope that, that through the blood of the Lamb, we will be cleansed. Right. And that's the offer here is that if we continue to, to honor the name of Christ in our lives and, and profess that lordship of him over us as his faithful followers, there's a hope of being cleansed yeah. through that. Yeah, it's not, not that we did anything to earn it or, or that we can do anything to gain more of it, but, but, but honoring him through our, our, our thoughts, our words, our actions, it's demonstrating that he really truly is Lord in our hearts. Right brings with it this idea of you will be washed clean, you will be made like those lambs, you know, being told, well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah, there's always that debate, well, you know, I'm saved or so, you know, but but salvation is a lifelong process. I I, I never obtain perfection until right. I stand before Christ. And so it is a process. Um, and some days I get it wrong. Sure. Um, just ask my wife and kids. Some days I, um, and then there's other days where, you know, and it, and it has a lot to do with, am I spending the time in, in God's word? Am I spending time in prayer? Um, those days where, where I make excuses or I, I you say I'm too busy and I'll get to it later and I forget to get to it. You know, that's where, that's where the, 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 the enemy can, can get a, get a foothold, can mm. sneak in there and, make your mind start thinking and, and make my temper shorter, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. it's a, it's an ongoing process where we have to put effort into that relationship with Jesus, um, for the rest of our lives. And like you said, we, there's different seasons in our lives. Um, we, we might retire vocationally, but not spiritually. Um, and, and that's what this, I think is calling us to, um, going back, you know, um, I know your deeds, you, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're you're dying, you're dead, because to sometimes we we drift away, and it's a slow fade, mm -hmm. and 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 then next thing you know, well I haven't been in church for, for a couple of weeks or a couple of months or, um, boy I haven't been reading my Bible like I was at one mm -hmm. point and and it's saying you know repent of those things, um, obey these things, but wake up. Because I'm going to come like a thief in the night. Yeah, and I think when we were talking the other day, you used this image that, that I keep um, thinking about in my mind to kind of wrap this all together. Um, and, and it kind of relates to James and his challenge that, that faith without works is dead. I mean, it's this idea that we can have faith, but if it does nothing for us in changing our lives or how we interact with people in the world, it's, it's a problem. And, and you kind of likened it to uh, being like a kayaker or a person in a boat trying to row upstream. Yeah, you know, tell me, tell me a little bit more about that, so, so we can unpack I, that a little. I more. don't know who shared that with me, but one point in my life, um, someone shared like our faith is a journey where we're paddling upstream. Uh, we have a destination to get to, um, but the current's coming down. So there's we we always have to be paddling. Sometimes uh, the the stream's a little calmer, so we get a little more pro uh, pro progress up the stream. Um, but sometimes we have to put a lot of effort in. But if we if we take our oar out. Um, to, to daydream or to look around, we're going to drift back downstream. Yeah, and, and I, I think one of the things I mentioned, too, was the idea that it's going to be kind of uncomfortable, especially in some of those stronger currents, because maybe at the time we're not as strong, and, and, and we, we don't really feel the progress. We don't see, like, right. oh, hey, we're not really moving forward as much as we thought we were. Um, but if we, if we just give up, that's when things really, you know, just wash us away. Right. You know, the world can just come along and whoosh, we're gone. Yeah. 
but it, you know, as long as we continue, if we keep putting that effort in, I think God honors that. Um, there, there's a similar story of a, a story of a man who was told by God to go out and push on this rock uh, to try to push this ginormous rock out uh, out of its place every day for for a long time and it just never moved and he he got so frustrated he's like god why did you make me do this and god says now look at you your hands are 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 calloused and stronger your your muscles have become toned and able to do more even if the rock didn't move the the strengthening was happening Mm. so even when we don't see sometimes or feel like things are really moving if we continue to allow god to work through the the disciplines of, of reading the scriptures, praying praying to God, um, you know, spending time just in silence, listening for God, all all those disciplines that we could list off together here and now, um, God still can work through that. Right, right. But we have to be willing to 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 put the oar in the in the creek first. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's not the virus. I promise. <laughs> yeah, scoot away. <laughs> If you can't laugh at yourself, right, folks? Uh, no. So, so anyway, um, yeah, I think that's a really great uh, kind of ending point there to remind us um, more than anything, we need to keep keep rowing, you know, even when it feels uncomfortable. And 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 I think there I think there are times where where God gives us breaks and and times of, of slower currents, not to not to stop rowing altogether, but to be able to kind of slow down and, and rest a little bit because we need that too. We can't yeah. just you know, we can't expect ourselves to constantly work ourselves to death. That's why the Sabbath was created. But but there's a beauty in recognizing we all are, are, are kind of rowing together here, too. Right. It's not like we're in a creek by ourselves. Well, and you think about Psalm 23, like it's those quiet waters. Mm. Um, the sheep wouldn't drink out of the waters that were flowing fast. So um, God brings us to those quiet waters in our time of need uh, to restore our souls. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and that's important to recognize. Yeah. Well, that's a great that's a great uh, place to kind of wrap things up. Again, again, I think that's just a great reminder. Let's 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 be let's be together, even even in these kind of unique situations. Yeah. Um, let's let's keep rowing. Let's let's keep our oars in the water together and encourage one another to 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 to, to keep pushing forward in our faith um, and and run that race that's been marked out for us. So, right. Stephen, uh, thank you again for joining me here. Um, I, I know we've had a lot of fun with this yeah. and, and I'm looking forward to maybe some more opportunities to do something like this or, or even other ways beyond, um, this, this shutdown time to, to worship together. I think it's been really uplifting for me and, and, um, I hope it has been for you yeah, as absolutely. well. Yeah. And we might be at it again next week. Yeah, we might just be. And, and if that's the case, you know, God's, God's still going to be here. I, right. I think, I think God can still be worshiped in a lot of creative ways. So yeah. Steve, would you mind closing us in a word of prayer here as we sure. wrap up? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for um, speaking to us through your scriptures. Uh, Lord, we really do need to hear from you in this, uh, in this time of, of uh, social separation uh, Lord, we uh, we ask you that that you may continue to speak to our hearts, that we may draw closer to you with the time that we have, um, because the excuse of not having enough time has been removed. But may we be intentional about spending some of that time with you. Lord, we don't know uh, what uh, tomorrow brings, um, but help us to trust you. Help us to lean not on our own understandings, but to, uh, in all things, give you praise and glory. Um, Lord, we, um, we thank you for the opportunity to, to gather together uh, like we are uh, through social media. But Lord, um, we, we ask that you may continue to, to challenge us to, to be your church, even in the midst of, of the chaos of the world. Lord, we thank you once again. Um, help us to just to trust you. Um, continue to work through Pastor Ryan and the first church here in Greencastle and, and also uh, with the State Line Church. We, um, we just thank you for, for those um, people that come together to be your church. And may we find you, may we find your peace, and may that peace be reflected to those around us. We pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.